Hello, hello, everybody. Um, first thing is you obviously find your way to Google Classroom. Hopefully you've read the little spiel um, in the assignment before you've come here. Uh, so this is the first thing on our agenda. We need to go through this quick little PowerPoint just kind of as a refresher of everything that we learned before that weird snow vid thing happened. Uh, so hopefully everyone's okay and ready to get started. Uh, we're going to again recover natural selection and then introduce something called uh, carrying capacity and how that affects natural selection and the diversity that we see um, in various species. So every ecosystem contains a finite amount of resources. This means that they have limits. Um, we can't just keep growing and growing and growing and growing. At some point that growth has to stop. Um, so some ecosystems can support large amounts of life for sure, but even the most fertile systems, or excuse me, fertile ecosystems are going to have these limits. The largest population size that an ecosystem can support is what we call the population's carrying capacity because they can only carry so much, right? Uh, populations tend to produce more offspring than the ecosystem can support. This may seem uh, harmful, but it actually helps to drive natural selection. So if we take a look at the image below, we've got overproduction, then we have variation. So we have a difference in color for these specific type of, they almost look like elk, not necessarily deer. Um, we'll just call them elk. <laughs> these individuals have uh, differing characteristics. So obviously the color is different. Some of them are light in color and some of them are dark in color. Then we have selection occurring. So they're either going to be selected for or against. So remember natural selection is all about the survival of the fittest. Which of these elk has the best, um, the best adaptations, the best characteristics to allow them to survive in their environment? I'd imagine since only the light colored elk there are dead, <laughs> that the dark brown uh, elk are more suited to that environment. And then of course we see adaptation as our fourth and final step in this image. Adaptation, the traits, those individuals that survive, they'll carry them on and then they'll pass them on to their own children, okay? Now, take a look at the graph up in the top right hand corner. This is generally what carrying capacity looks like. Um, because we have overproduction, we're also going to eventually dip under that carrying capacity line as well. So the line carrying capacity, this dotted line here, kind of serves as, you know, the average where we're teetering above and below, but that's kind of the average, that's our limit there. Uh, for the population size. And over time, once we find that carrying capacity, that's when it, we'll see it start to, the population size start to go up and down, up and down. But overall, it's gonna average out to be that number there for carrying capacity. So everything above <clears throat> would be overproduction. Okay, everything above the carrying capacity would be considered overproduction. When a population exceeds its carrying capacity, the organisms with the best adaptations are most likely to survive and reproduce. So this is where we see selection and adaptation occurring. Okay, they're most likely to survive and reproduce. This helps increase the frequency or the amount of those beneficial alleles within the population. In this example, the beneficial alleles were the darker brown elk. Right? That's why they seem to be more common in the population because they've lived long enough to pass on their traits to their kiddos. If you need a bigger uh, picture or a clearer image of what this graph looks like, I zoomed in and put it on another slide for you. But this is our population size on the left, time at the bottom. Over time, that population size is going to increase until it hits that carrying capacity, and then it's going to just kind of waver around the carrying capacity. 
oh, um, and another way to say this would be like, okay, we're growing, we're growing, we're growing, we've hit that carrying capacity, but we don't know yet. Then we realize, wow, there's too many of us in this population and then some of us die because there's not enough food or there's not enough shelter or water or we can't protect ourselves, right? That's when selection starts to occur and then we reproduce and then, oh, same thing happens again. Selection is going to occur. Then we die off, then we reproduce. That would be why that occurs, why it starts to waver around that line. Okay, if two populations become separated, right, we talked about this before the SNOVID happened, they may be forced to adapt to different environments. This may cause natural selection to favor different alleles in each population. We even looked at the same example with the beetles. Um, there was a natural uh, river that formed between this population, separating it into two, and eventually the two different populations became two different species over time because their alleles were so different and they hadn't been interbreeding. Also, mutations can introduce new alleles into one population that are not present in the other. Over time, natural selection will again increase the diversity that is found within a species. So what we also had noted last time was that the species up at the top has more green alleles and that, of course, increased in frequency, while the population below had a lot of lighter colored alleles, kind of like the yellow, pink, white, um, and that also increased in frequency, as we can see um, at the end result there. As long as the members of the two populations continue to interbreed, then they're still considered the same species. But <laughs> a species contains all of the organisms that reproduce and create fertile offspring. If they can't, if they're not continuing to reproduce together, if they're not, um, if, that's, if that's not happening, then yes, over time, they can become very different genetically. And if they were to re, reunite and start to try to reproduce again, it wouldn't, it wouldn't amount to much. <laughs> because they're two separate species. Um, so it, they wouldn't produce any fertile offspring anymore. Uh, I brought up the example in the past about mules and, not mules, donkeys and horses. Donkeys and horses have um, become so different over time, a lot of time. And you can physically see these differences now as well. Donkeys are quite short, have the, yeah. You guys know donkey and horse. They're very different. They're two different species. However, they can mate and create offspring, but those offspring are not fertile. To be fertile means that that offspring could then go and have children. The mule, which is created from a donkey and a horse, we get a mule. A mule is not fertile. It cannot have kids of its own. Fun fact of the day if you uh, didn't know that. While these spiders look very different, they are all part of the same species and can reproduce with each other. So there we go, in case you didn't know that about these spiders. Sometimes two populations become adapted to different environmental conditions and the variations within the population will cause them to no longer interbreed. When this happens, the two populations are considered different species, again. And here we have an example of two species of squirrel that have adapted to different regions, Harris's antelope squirrel and the white-tailed antelope squirrel. It looks like they were separated by a canyon and a river, which probably caused the original selection and adaptations to occur. Yeah. We also saw this with Darwin's finches. Some were used to hunting for things on the ground, um, while some lived in bushes and trees and they were able to get food and resources from that higher up region, also, uh, which is why we had so many different types of finches because they were all used to different areas of the island, um, kind of like different environments almost, where they could get their own resources that they had adapted to. Oh, here we go. Forgot about the image here. Uh, so we had different 
beaks that were accustomed to cracking nuts or that were accustomed to pecking worms out of the dirt and insects out of the air. When a new species is formed, it's called speciation. Pretty easy to remember. Speciation is usually the result of populations becoming adapted to different environmental conditions as we see here and we just talked about. Finches are a type of bird in the Galapagos Islands. We talked about that. We've already discussed how a small population of finches had migrated to these volcanic islands off the coast of Ecuador and how they all had different beaks, which were accustomed to the specific um, area that they were in. Different types of seeds and insects made different alleles more favorable based on the niche each population filled uh, on an island. So a niche is kind of like a group. You have different groups. Uh, and I guess the way that this occurred on, on the Galapagos Islands is that you have different groups of foods. Someone that's going to eat insects doesn't need a very big, thick beak. Um, they're going to favor the nuts because they are used to cracking them with their large beaks, while a bird with a smaller, narrower beak can't really crack the nut. They, their beak's not hard enough to crack a nut. But they can eat insects. So we have two different groups of food, resources that are available to them, and then of course two different adaptations that come from that. So the big beak to crack the nut and the small thin beak to uh, catch the insect midair. So they then fill those niches. Because each population faced different conditions, they filled these different niches. Natural selection favored different alleles for size and beak shape. Over time, variations in, uh, between finch populations increased as each population became more adapted to its island. Natural selection increased the diversity because of the different alleles. Um, this helped these finches survive and reproduce. Each population became so adapted to its niche that today, none of these populations interbreed. Okay, if they don't interbreed, what does that mean? They are their own individual species. This means that speciation, speciation has occurred. Okay, new species have been formed, speciation. Now we're going to take a look at our lab, which is going to focus more on the carrying capacity and how uh, certain adaptations and even human interference can affect natural selection and the carrying capacity in the environment, excuse me, in the ecosystem. <laughs> 